Hello everyone, my name is Ines Chami. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University and in this tutorial I will give a brief introduction to hyperbolic embeddings and their use in machine learning. I'll first start by giving a brief geometry review and I'll try to present some basic notions about Riemannian geometry. I'll then introduce hyperbolic geometry, which is the focus of this tutorial, and I'll provide some intuition for why it is useful to embed tree-like and hierarchical data. And finally, I'll go over the different steps to learn hyperbolic representations of graph structure data. Okay, so let's first review some basic geometry concepts. A topological manifold is a topological space, which is simply a set with a collection of open subsets that locally looks Euclidean. What locally Euclidean means is that for every open subset of the topological space, we can find a map called a coordinate chart that maps this open subset to the flat Euclidean space. The collection of all charts that covers a manifold is called an atlas, and a common example that you may be familiar with is the atlas of the surface of Earth, which can be represented using two-dimensional maps that represent local regions of the surface of Earth, and the collection of all these maps is called an atlas. We can map two coordinate charts to each other using transition functions, and based on the properties that, th that these functions have, we will have different types of manifolds. In a topological manifold, these transition functions are continuous. In CK differentiable manifolds, they are CK differentiable, and in smooth manifolds, they are infinitely differentiable. These transition functions are what allows us to do calculus on manifolds, like compute integrals and derivatives. And so the more structure we have on these transition functions, the easier it will be to do calculus on manifolds. To actually calculate things like distances on manifold, we need to define a few concepts. A curve is just a smooth path that runs along a manifold, which is parameterized using a map from an interval to the manifold itself. And the speed of a curve is just the direction of change along the curve, which can be measured using the time derivative. The velocity of a curve at a point defines a tangent vector, and if we take the space of all possible tangent vectors at a point, we get the tangent space, which is actually a linear vector space with the same dimension as the manifold. In particular, because the tangent space has this Euclidean structure, we can leverage it to perform our usual Euclidean operations on manifolds. The meta-algorithm is to map the points in the tangent space, uh, perform operations in the tangent space, and then map back to the manifold. We'll see next uh, that when the manifold has a specific structure, we can define maps from and to the tangent space called the exponential and logarithmic maps. Okay, so let's now introduce a specific type of smooth manifold. A Riemannian manifold is a smooth manifold that comes with a family of smooth inner products in the tangent space called Riemannian metric. This inner product varies smoothly between points, and a Riemannian manifold has all the nice smoothness properties which allow us to do uh, calculus on manifolds and compute important quantities such as distances, angles, um, areas, or volumes. In particular, the length of a curve uh, on a Riemannian manifold uh, can be computed by integrating the metric tensor along the curve, and we can also define a distance metric on the manifold as the length of the curve connecting two points with minimum length. These minimum length curves are called geodesic, and these are the generalization of straight lines in Euclidean space. We can compute these geodesics using the metric tensor. Basically, if we parameterize a curve using local chart coordinates, uh, we can show that a geodesic curve has to satisfy the geodesic equation, which is uh, written here, where those gamma i, j, k are uh, Christoffel symbols and can be computed exactly using the Riemannian metric tensor. Two important maps that are defined on Riemannian manifolds are the exponential and logarithmic maps. The exponential map maps a tangent vector to the manifold and is defined as the value of the geodesic curve starting at a point p with initial velocity v at times t equals 1. Um, its inverse, the logarithmic map, is going to map a point on the manifold to the tangent space. In summary, we can compute geodesics on Riemannian manifolds, and this gives rise to the notion of distances, exponential and logarithmic maps, which we'll see how to use uh, next, uh, and especially to design uh, graph embedding methods. And so let's now move to a specific type of Riemannian geometry, which is the hyperbolic geometry. So we're all familiar with Euclidean geometry, which is probably one of the oldest mathematical systems developed by Euclid, uh, and is based on five axioms. The first four axioms uh, have a very simple form, and the, fourth, uh, and the fifth axiom is stated as follows. 
Given a line and a point not on the line, there exists exactly one line parallel to the given line that goes through the point. So this fifth postulate uh, has a much more complicated form than the other four, and this gave rise to many controversies among mathematicians for many years, as they were trying to prove that the fifth postulate was a consequence of the other four postulates, uh, with no success, obviously. And it's not until the 19th century, uh, with the work of Gauss and other mathematicians, that non-Euclidean geometry was discovered by essentially using alternative forms for the fifth postulate. So, for instance, in hyperbolic geometry, there are infinitely many such parallel lines that go through a point. Um, and in a sense, these parallel lines curve away from each other, and so they never intersect. The, as a side note, the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry led to many um, scientific advances in physics, especially where the development of the uh, theory of relativity by Einstein was enabled by tools of non-Euclidean geometry. And so in the context of Riemannian geometry, the hyperbolic space can be described as a Riemannian manifold, as we've seen before, uh, with a constant Riemannian curvature tensor. So here this curvature is used to measure to which extent the Riemannian metric tensor is not locally isometric to that of the Euclidean space. So basically it measures how much an object deviates from a flat uh, Euclidean plane or object. And so similarly, spherical geometry has a constant positive curvature while the Euclidean geometry has a constant zero curvature. Okay, and so why do we care about this hyperbolic space? So there are many theoretical results showing that a tree can be embedded almost perfectly into a hyperbolic space, but this is not possible in the Euclidean space. At a high level, this is because uh, the hyperbolic geometry is some sort of continuous version of trees. So to provide mo more intuition, let's look at the volume growth in trees. For instance, consider a binary tree. The number of nodes in the tree is gonna grow exponentially as we increase the depth of the tree. And on the other hand, the volume of balls in the Euclidean space only grows polynomially with the radius. And so if we try to embed trees in Euclidean space, the outermost leaves will become increasingly close to one another and will quickly run out of space to embed the data. In contrast, the volume of balls in hyperbolic space grows exponentially with the radius. So in this circle illustration on the Poincaré disk, which is a model of hyperbolic space, all the hyperbolic um, bats uh, have the exact same size uh, in hyperbolic space, but we see that as we get closer uh, to the circle boundary, they appear to be infinitely smaller. And this illustrates that we have a exponential volume growth, uh, giving more room to uh, fit complex hierarchies in the, in the space. And the second interesting property about uh, hyperbolic space is the behavior of geodesics. So consider a simple tree uh, on three nodes, and let's assume that we place the root of the tree uh, in a, at the origin uh, and we place points in a small triangle. Uh, in the tree metric space, the shortest path between the two leaves X and Y uh, has to go through their uh, lowest common ancestor, which is their parent in this simple example. And in Euclidean space, the uh, shortest path between X and Y is just going to be the straight line connecting them. Uh, which is going to highly distort the tree distances because it's going to make it appear much shorter than it actually is. In hyperbolic space, the geodesics bend towards the origin of the space and so they give a much better approximation of the graph distances um, and so they better represent this behavior of, of having to go up in the hierarchy and then down uh, to uh, connect two points or two leaf nodes. So before we describe the method uh, used to learn hyperbolic uh, graph embeddings, we need to introduce some tools and formulas. So here we work with the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space because the formulas are relatively simple and are very similar to spherical geometry, except that the spherical angles become hyperbolic angles. The hyperboloid model is a model of n-dimensional hyperbolic geometry in which points are represented on the forward sheet of a two-sheeted hyperboloid of n plus one dimensional Minkowski space, which means that the points must have their Lorentz product equal to one. The Riemannian metric is simply the Lorentzian inner product, and it allows to derive geodesics by solving the geodesic equation that we've seen before. We can also compute distances on the hyperboloid, um, and we can also derive exponential and logarithmic maps in closed form in this model of hyperbolic space. <laughs> 
Finally, we can also project points um, in Rn plus 1 onto the tangent space by renormalizing them in terms of the Lorentzian product. And we can easily check that after this projection, uh, any point in Rn plus 1 uh, becomes um, projected onto the right tangent space. And so the reason why I'm introducing these projections is because they will be very useful in practice to um, do Riemannian optimization and also avoid numerical instabilities during uh, optimization. In general, the hypervaluate model is considered to be more numerically stable compared to other models such as the Poincaré model of hyperbolic space, which makes it a good candidate for optimization. However, note that there are still some functions that may cause numerical instabilities in practice here, and so it's really important to use clamping tricks when we implement these functions uh, in Python or whichever uh, coding language uh, to avoid getting NANs uh, during optimization. So now we have all the necessary tools to learn hyperbolic embedding, so let's dig in. Just as a quick reminder, graphs are a universal data structure uh, used to describe relational data. In this representation, nodes represent uh, objects, so for instance, entities in a knowledge graph, and edges represent relationships between them. In graph representation learning, the goal is to find a low-dimensional uh, continuous representation of the graph that preserves uh, its information. Um, and so usually we compute one embedding per node, which are called node embeddings, and we use them in downstream machine learning applications for uh, predictions tasks, for instance. And so, for instance, if two users have many friends in common in a social network, then good representation should preserve this information by making the node representation similar in the embedding space. And this notion of embedding similarity in Euclidean space is usually defined using the Euclidean distances or Euclidean inner products. Here we focus on hierarchical data, which appears in many important applications. So for instance, in biology, the evolutionary relatedness between uh, species is described using phylogenetic trees, which have a hierarchical structure. And in linguistics, word taxonomies can also be described using graphs with hierarchies um, and hierarchical structures. Uh, as we've seen before, it's challenging to represent hierarchical data with Euclidean space, and so we want to use a hyperbolic embedding space to better uh, represent the hierarchies in this, uh, in this data sets. Okay, so the general framework to compute graph representation takes as input a graph uh, with vertices and edges, and it defines the following components. First, it picks an embedding space, which is commonly taken to be the Euclidean space, but here we'll work with the hyperbolic embedding space. It then defines a mapping from nodes uh, in the graph to, uh, to the embedding space, and this is the, the encoding step. It defines a mapping from the embeddings to score, so this is the decoding step where basically we compute similarities from embeddings and assigns um, a score to embedding pairs. In Euclidean space, this is usually uh, done by taking the Euclidean dot product, but we'll see how to generalize this to hyperbolic embeddings. It then computes a loss function, which basically is going to encourage similar nodes to have a high embedding similarity score and dissimilar nodes to have a lower similarity score. And finally, it defines an optimization algorithm, which uh, is going to be used to learn the embeddings uh, by uh, gradient descent and loss function minimization. And so the output of this process is uh, graph embeddings, uh, or more specifically vertex embeddings in the chosen representation space. And this can be used uh, in the stream machine learning task as features for nodes in a graph. And we can do uh, link prediction, node classification, graph classification, many other tasks uh, using these representations. Okay, so how do we generalize this to uh, the hyperbolic space? Here I'm going to describe the model by Nickel, which is uh, one of the first uh, in this uh, realm of hyperbolic embeddings. Uh, but note that there are many different ways to learn embeddings of graphs in hyperbolic spaces. So first, the encoder, uh, which maps vertices to hyperbolic spaces, is a simple embedding lookup. And what it does is it assigns a point uh, in the hyperbolic space to each vertex ID in the graph. And in practice, it's also common to add a projection onto the manifold for numerical stability and to make sure that points remain on the manifold uh, after a gradient step, for instance. Then the decoder takes two points in hyperbolic space and is going to use the negative hyperbolic distance to assign a similarity score to the embedding pairs. Intuitively, similar pairs should have a low hyperbolic distance, while, uh, while dissimilar pairs should uh, be far away in the hyperbolic space. Uh, 
In terms of loss function, uh, Nickel proposed to adapt the skip grammar to VEC model to learn uh, graph representations. So basically, the numerator term here in the loss will try to pull connected pair closer together, while the denominator will push negative pairs apart in the hyperbolic space. And this can be interpreted as a soft ranking loss, and uh, usually it's common to approximate the denominator with a negative sampling, just like uh, word to vec uh, in skip gram models to um, have a more uh, computationally efficient model. And we're still missing one key component here, which is the optimization algorithm, and so we'll talk about this next. In Euclidean space, we can apply gradient descent steps by following Euclidean geodesics, which are straight lines. And so here we need to adapt these algorithms to account for the curved structure of the hyperbolic space, or more generally, Riemannian manifolds. And this is exactly what Riemannian SGD does. So this algorithm was proposed by Bonnebel in uh, 2013, and it starts by computing Euclidean gradients and scales them uh, by the inverse metric tensor to account for the Riemannian structure of the space. It then projects the result onto the tangent space uh, to get the Riemannian gradient, and as we've seen before, the Riemannian metric tensor and projection have a simple form in the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space, so we can compute uh, hyperbolic gradients easily. And finally, the last step is to apply the gradient update. And so in Euclidean SGD, the update is to add the gradient uh, times the learning rate, but we don't have a notion of vector addition in Riemannian manifolds. Uh, but we do have a similar concept, which is the exponential map. And so RSGD uses the exponential map to map Riemannian gradients, which are uh, basically tangent vectors, onto the manifold. It follows the curved geodesic along the Riemannian gradient direction, and in contrast with Euclidean gradient uh, descent, which follows straight line geodesics, the Riemannian gradient is going to follow curved line geodesics. Um, and again, the exponential map has a closed form uh, expression in hyperbolic space, and so we just need to be careful uh, with numerical instabilities when we implement these algorithms. Okay, so once we have learned these embeddings, we can use them in many downstream applications for prediction tasks, for instance, but we can also use them to visualize hierarchical data. And in particular, the Poincaré model of hyperbolic space, which is another model to represent the, the hyperbolic geometry, is very useful in two dimensions because all the points can be visualized on a disk. Um, and in this model of hyperbolic space, being close to the origin uh, can be interpreted as being uh, higher in the hierarchy or closer to the root of the, of the tree or the space. And so in particular, we can map uh, points on the hyperboloid model onto the Poincaré disk using a stereographic projection illustrated here. Uh, and we see that um, the embeddings uh, learned uh, here by uh, the model proposed by Nickel uh, capture the hierarchy in the data quite well. So for instance, if you look at a hyperbolic geometry, um, it's a concept that is lower in the hierarchy than uh, mathematics, which is itself lower than science. So we really see that these embeddings capture uh, important and meaningful hierarchies uh, found in data sets. Finally, note that we can use hyperbolic embeddings in machine learning applications. So for instance, recent work explored uh, embeddings of knowledge graphs in hyperbolic spaces, which comes with the challenge of modeling relation types, which we didn't talk about um, in, this, uh, in this presentation. Other works explore hyperbolic neural networks uh, for classification tasks uh, in hyperbolic spaces. So uh, in particular, there are models to generalize graph neural networks to the hyperbolic space. Hyperbolic embeddings have also been leveraged in natural language processing for question answering or learning uh, representations of words uh, in hyperbolic spaces, uh, since we know that language comes with a hierarchical structure as well. And finally, there, has, there have been recent works that uh, explore generative models uh, with the hyperbolic latent spaces to generate uh, data that comes with the hierarchical structure as well. So many, many ongoing work uh, in, this, um, in this domain. So this is the end of this uh, tutorial. If you'd like to learn more about hyperbolic embeddings and their uses in machine learning, feel free to reach out to me or check out our blog posts and open source repositories. Um, and thank you for listening.